Hey guys, so let's jump into the second um, a part of the stroke series, which is going to be going over motor problems. So the rest of the uh, PowerPoints are kind of break things down by the different body systems that are affected by stroke. So you can better understand what are the problems that we have and then how can I help a patient with them. So what kind of motor problems can a stroke patient have? They can have what's called one-sided weakness, which is also known as hemiplegia. They can have contractures, which is effectively kind of where their um, limbs are stuck or fixed in a certain point from lack of range of motion. They can have what's called foot drop, which is where um, their foot has, since it's not like in a shoe and walking around and they're immobilized, um, and also because of some of the neurological pathways, they lose the ability to hold their foot upright so their foot kind of just stuck, get stuck kind of like in a drop position. Um, and then they also can have generally decreased mobility and also decreased coordination um, as a whole. Um, and then on top of that, they can also have a self-care deficit. In other words, not be able to um, take care of themselves the way that they used to. So pretty much let's kind of break down how I'm gonna help with each of these things. So let's start with the one-sided weakness. If I have a left brain stroke, just as a reminder, if you or if you didn't watch the other PowerPoint that was just general about stroke, that if I had a left brain stroke, or in other words, well, uh, in other words the left side of my brain was uh, affected, then I have right-sided body weakness. And then if I have right-sided of my brain that was where the stroke happened, then the left side of my body is what's affected. So whatever side that they're having that weakness, we need to be worried that they can actually forget their limb. Like I've gone in and the patient literally has like their arm behind their back. They don't even realize where it is. It's like they almost forget about it. So you're kind of in charge to not only just remind them, but to watch out for that limb because they can't feel it and they can't see it. And um, we also are going to be worried about deconditioning. And what that is, is, is that, you know, over time, um, after not being mobile, not using that limb, not strengthening that limb, they are just not going to be as strong as what they were before. Um, additionally, they're going to be at risk for skin breakdown. They're going to be at risk for contractures. Um, and in general, just having injury, especially to that side that's weak or um, they're not uh, as strong on that side. And they can also have pain. They can have decreased sensation, you know, like um, numbness, tingling, paresthesias, but they can also have hyperesthesia where they have kind of um, intense pain, kind of like, like their limb is on fire. So as the nurse, um, I can help support them in these things by doing regular positioning, um, doing splints and braces, regular assessments, and making sure not to pull the patient by that limb. Um, I should always be, um, you know, when I'm repositioning them, I should never be grabbing them, especially by that limb, because it's going to be more at risk for injury. So how about specifically for contractures and foot drop? So the problem here is that they have limited or no mobility and the patient cannot protect their own limbs. So it's pretty much my job as the nurse to kind of stand in um, you know, and do that motion with them. So I can do this with support devices like hand cones or hand splints. You know, I know a lot of people and you'll see this in real life, but in nursing school world, you know, the washcloth is not a good idea because the washcloth is very um, flexible um, where like, you know, it, depending on this, like the size and the patient's hands. Um, and like if the patient has moisture in their hands, like the size of that washcloth can change. Whereas a hand cone, it's going to put them in a more anatomical position. And the hand cone effectively stands, like it goes in around their hand and it kind of keeps their hand in a normal position instead of like kind of flexed or in, or, um, you know, in a abnormal position where they can form a contracture. We can also put them in hand splints or leg splints to try to keep them in a normal position. Um, um, using foot boards, which keep their foot kind of pushed up, like it kind of keeps the foot, like if this is my foot, if instead of having it drop, it kind of pushes it up to keep it from, um, you know, having that drop position. Um, we also, um, you know, do the, what we call POTUS boots, um, but there's, uh, you know, effectively, um, Oh, what do you call it? Um, uh, it's a uh, it's a specialized boot that keeps your foot in a normal position. Again, the foot's dropping, and so it kind of just pushes the ankle up and puts it in a normal position. Um, and then, I mean, your book talks about high top tennis shoes. I've never seen anyone put that on a patient, but it's possible. Anything to keep their foot in a normal position. 
Um, but getting back to where I was at, um, net regular range of motion, the best way we can prevent contractures is moving that limb. So that means every time you go in to move the patient, like, you know, sitting there and doing range of motion for them, if they can't do it, flex each of the parts of the joints um, and move it in different directions to make sure that it, even though they're not able to exercise it or strength train it at the moment, that it's still getting some movement so it doesn't get stuck in a contracture. Um, and then physical and occupational therapy are key for these patients. So um, for the fact that they have decreased mobility in a self-care deficit, you know, the big problem is one, they have a neurological impairment. So they're gonna have decreased level of consciousness. They can have fatigue and immobility. Um, the, they have physical deficits. Um, and then that leads to more ability, uh, immobility and weakness. Um, and so they can't care for themselves. They're and then like, there's so many risk factors for immobility. When we get into musculoskeletal as well, we're gonna talk about those, um, but there's so many complications from immobility. Um, depression and anxiety can result because they can't take care of themselves and they're going to be at high risk for injury, fall, and skin breakdown. So how can I help with this? I'm going to encourage mobility. So if the patient can do something for themselves, or if they can get mobile, I'm going to encourage that. Get them up in the chair, um, you know, sit them up in the bed while they're having their meals, um, encouraging them to work with physical therapy, get up in the hallways, even just little position changes, trying to help. Um, that self-care is so important, giving them as much independence as possible, trying to allow them to do as much as they can for themselves. That includes using adaptive devices. So if the patient can't feed themselves, um, you know, because maybe they have weakness on the side for their hand, that's their dominant hand, then let's use adaptive devices. And, um, you know, those adaptive devices, they can help because they can allow us to um, pretty much give the patient back their independence and allow them to be able to do things for themselves they couldn't do without those devices. Um, physical therapy and occupation Occupational therapy are going to be key to help with this, to teach them like new ways to do things. They have to kind of relearn how to do things that they learned when they were very young. Um, turning them every two hours is going to be important to prevent that skin breakdown. Um, and then therapeutic communication and treatment um, for anxiety, depression as needed. Um, it's really important to treat these patients like adults just because they had a stroke doesn't mean that they're stupid. They understand what you're saying. Um, it's just about talking to them like a human being um, and really just kind of giving them, uh, you know, um, simple basic directions and, um, you know, supporting them in that, like, you know, it might, you might have to be extra patient. It might take a little bit more time. Um, they may just need to talk sometimes about how frustrated that they are. So um, definitely just want to be there for that patient and um, try to support them and meet them where they're at. So that's kind of the overview of how we can help patients with stroke, uh, have had strokes that have musculoskeletal or motor problems. Um, so, uh, you know, keep on a lookout for the other parts of the series and um, kind of start getting that whole picture together for how can we help these stroke patients. See you next time.